This is part two of a double episode titled Emperors, Robber Barons, Cowboys, and Indians. And if you missed part one of this episode, you may want to go back and give it a listen because throughout this episode, we will be recalling things that we discussed before. So, without further ado, I give you part two of Emperors, Robber Barons, Cowboys, and Indians. On February 6, 1935, sibling rivalry was forever changed worldwide when the Parker brothers released a board game that would shatter the lives of little brothers globally and usher in a whole new era of alternate facts and house rules versus actual facts and rules, depending on whose house you were playing at. I speak, of course, of Monopoly, also subtitled the fast-dealing property trading game. At my house, my big brother had designed a few house rules for us that actually sweetened the game up a bit and kept it under six hours long. I pray I do the same thing with this podcast episode. And one of my brother's rules put all of the money that was collected from the negative chance and community chess cards, you know, the ones where you have to pay some kind of a penalty, we put all of that money in the middle of the board. And if somebody landed on free parking, well, then they would win the pot. And then we'd start it all over again. And it was a godsend when you were low on cash or unlucky with the dice. Another house rule that he had, and a lot of people actually play with this one, is if you land on go, you get $400 instead of the standard $200 for merely passing it. Now, my family never played with the auctions option while I was growing up, although later in life, I would grow to love this devastating facet of the game. But the way that we played was, if you landed on a space and you didn't want it or you couldn't afford it, it remained available for someone else to land on and buy if they so chose. Which did lengthen the game a bit, but it also made it more fun for me and my little sister. But other than that, we were pretty consistent with the rules that were written on the box. My brother taught me to buy everything as quickly as possible even if you had to mortgage properties like crazy in order to do it, to acquire as many deeds as you could so that you would have leverage in trading. And he could haggle himself a good deal with just about any property or with offers of one free landing on a high-priced hotel property of his if he didn't have enough money to barter with. And he would always offer to complete my boardwalk park place monopoly, the most expensive one on the board, if I gave him two smaller valued monopolies. I took the bait every time. Sadly, boardwalk is overrated, much like the cat-infested beachfront of the real boardwalk in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Now, don't mistake me. I love going to AC to gamble. And I have taken the depressing three-hour-long bus trip from Port Authority a bunch of times with my buddies. But parts of the beach along the boardwalk outside of the casinos in Atlantic City are like a giant litter box for the stray cat families that live on the beach hunting fish, hot dog scraps, and seagulls. Lots of seagulls. One of the funniest things that I ever saw on the boardwalk in Atlantic City was while I was taking a break from a poker tournament to get some fresh air. So I step out of the door at Harrah's, who, by the way, has two turbo poker tournaments a day for a buy-in of only 60 to 70 bucks. And they're nice because you can't lose more than that, and you get to play for a couple of hours without losing your rent. And you could win into the thousand or thousands of dollars, depending on how many players they let into the tournament, for a relatively low investment. But anyway, I veered way off course from my hilarious boardwalk story from Atlantic City. And full disclosure here, 
It's a little mean on my part to call this story funny, but I really couldn't help the victim in this cautionary tale, so I will have to resort to calling it tragically funny. Okay, so there I was, taking a break from the Turbo Tournament outside of Harrah's on a scorching, hot, touristy August afternoon, and the boardwalk is packed with people. And the lines for all the food stands are like forever long. And this poor girl who, I'm sorry to say, was a bit on the larger side, just happened to be walking by within earshot of me with a friend of hers. And they were both carrying this truly loaded cartons of chili cheese fries. And the one girl says to her friend, Oh my God, that line was ridiculous. I'm starving. Let's go out and eat on the beach. (laughs) And the timing of the Hitchcockian gang of seagulls that swarmed them was priceless. And for all you smarty pants out there, I'm well aware that a grouping of seagulls is called a colony and that a gathering of crows is called a murder. Thank you very much, Homer Simpson. Anyway... These poor girls are assaulted by the colony of seagulls and they lose all their fries to the birds and the sand. (laughs) These two hungry, frustrated ladies, they just lose their mind and they start screaming and crying and swearing and then they chase the seagulls towards the ocean, screaming all the while. And then in another wave of brilliant animal comic timing, the beach cats and I mean cats as in feline, not a couple of cool cats, they pounce upon the seagulls, which causes the birds to shoot back in the direction of the girls who are chasing them, and they just hit the deck in the mess of their sandy chili cheese fries while the seagulls are defecating everywhere in the air and cats are murdering birds all around them. I mean, what was I going to do to assist there, you know? And I might be a jerk for laughing, but tell me that you wouldn't do the same. Anyway, the point is, the boardwalk in Atlantic City is nothing like what it used to be back in the heyday of the Miss America pageant. And it is the least landed on property in an average game of Monopoly. The railroad properties are greatly underrated by most opponents that I've had in my decades love of the game. Because while they don't command the highest value per landing, having them spread out among the board prevents your opponents from evading your grouped-on-one-street-only monopolies, which are easily bypassed by rolling boxcars or a 12 on the dice. And many people will argue this point with me, but I think that the best part about the railroads are that you can't build houses or hotels on it because it effectively eliminates the power of the two property, tax, chance, and community chess cards that are in the game. And if you're not familiar with them, when you draw those cards, you have to pay between $25 and $40 per house that you own and between $100 and $120 per hotel. It's a game changer. And with a couple of lucky rolls of the dice, you could go from a poor man to a rich man and vice versa. The original game of Monopoly was invented by an American anti-monopolist named Maggie Phillips, who wanted to highlight the negative sides of putting land in private monopolies. It was originally titled The Landlord's Game and was released in 1903. Monopoly as we know it today was based on this game and seemed to deviate from the original lesson that it was designed to illustrate. The Parker Brothers version that debuted in 1935 shows that an economic system that rewards the creation of wealth was better than one where monopolists have roadblocks and can thrive. Which brings me to the question, are monopolies good or bad? President Benjamin Harrison seems to suggest that they are bad when he gets the Sherman Antitrust Act passed through Congress in 1890 
to keep tabs on business activities and to prohibit anti-competitive business practices, which included monopolies, but not all monopolies. You see, I was always under the impression that any kind of monopoly was illegal, but it turns out that there are good monopolies and bad ones. The bad ones are when a company takes specific measures to prevent anyone else from getting into the same business, which is why the Sherman Antitrust Act was also called the Competition Law, because it kept the market competitive, which is beneficial for customers. Many of the businesses in the mid to late 1800s in America, like the barbed wire industry that we introduced at the end of part one of this episode, were owned by one big company who would raise prices to cut the competition and then buy up the weaker companies to combine them into a bigger entity. Not an entirely foreign concept to us today. The author Anne Rand was actually not in favor of the Sherman Antitrust Act. She said that it was, quote, the penalizing of ability for being ability, the penalizing of success for being success, and the sacrifice of productive genius to the demands of envious mediocrity. Kind of a tough statement to argue with, right? Theodore Roosevelt, on the other hand, supported the Antitrust Act, and he spoke out against corporate monopolies in the super wealthy. And he asked Congress to limit a company's power and to give some of it over to the workers through organized labor unions. While Teddy Roosevelt agreed that businesses were a good thing, he stressed that bad suits and unfair prices are not and he broke up the Northern Securities Company, the biggest of all the railroad monopolies. And during his presidency, he brought forth 44 antitrust suits, and some of them were against corporations who made significant contributions to his getting elected in the first place, like J.P. Morgan & Company, U.S. Steel, and George J. Gould, who was also in the railroad business. Some familiar cases that feature the Antitrust Act are Standard Oil versus the U.S. government and AT&T versus the U.S. government, both of which, by the way, resulted in victories for the Fed, which forced the companies to break up. Conversely, Microsoft versus the U.S. government was a loss for Uncle Sam. Nerds rule. Scattered curiosity, during World War II... The British ordered these special Monopoly sets that had money, real money, not Monopoly money, compasses and maps hidden inside of the board games that they sent off to their POWs who were trapped in Germany through the Red Cross. And a bonus, bonus curiosity, the name of the old guy with the white hair and mustache and top hat that's featured on the front of the Monopoly game, his name, Rich Uncle Pennybags. In 1874, the people of the Great Plains realized the potential of Joseph Glidden's elementary invention of barbed wire and rushed to corner the market of this revolutionary tool that will shape and define the face of the American frontier, prisons worldwide, WWF wrestling, a la the bat of Mick Foley, and will make its wartime debut in the upcoming Spanish-American War, which is finally a war that doesn't have a confusing name. It is indeed Spain versus America over the liberation of Cuba and the Philippines. But more on that later. The mid-1870s saw many challenges arise in the lands west of the Mississippi River. There were locust plagues and droughts, blizzards, fence cuttings, land disputes, and an unusually high number of tornadoes. And all the while, Joseph Glidden and his new partner Isaac Elwood have just opened the Barb Wire Fence Company and are selling tons of the popular new product in the Midwest, 
helping nearby Chicago become an even more important railroad hub. Meanwhile, their neighbor and rival Jacob Haish, the architect and lumberman who was attempting to out-patent Glidden in our earlier episode with his S-barb wire design, was struggling to compete. Because he wasn't just competing with Glidden's wire, but similar products were also being made and sold around the world by do-it-yourselfers. But Glidden and Elwood's operation had the edge over the market because their barbed wire was the first to be mass-produced for distribution. And a Massachusetts company by the name of Washburn and Moen took notice of the success of these two Illinois moguls and entered negotiations to buy Glidden's patent for barbed wire. Now, the former educator, Joseph Glidden, is no dummy, and he ends up settling for $60,000 up front and $0.25 per 100 pounds sold in royalties. And he will go on to be the Democratic nominee for Illinois State Senator, vice president of the DeKalb National Bank, owner of the DeKalb Rolling Mill, and the director of the Northwestern Railroad Company. Isaac Elwood, on the other hand, decides to take a position in the new venture as a partner, forming the Elwood and Washburn and Moen Company, also referred to as simply The Company. And they proceeded to buy up all of the barbed wire patents that they could and slowly began monopolizing the market. The company also advertised their barbed wire with a publication that they put out called the Glidden Fence Journal. And so then Jacob Hayes turns around and prints his own journal called The Regulator. And he even ups the ante by printing fancy posters as well but it's clear to both companies that they need pitchmen to prove the effectiveness of barbed wire to the skeptics in the West. So, Isaac Elwood hires a young Illinoisan and future robber baron named John Warren Gates to demonstrate their barbed wire product in San Antonio, Texas. And Gates quintuples their sales in just three years. In a fun scattered curiosity, before this whole barbed wire rivalry between Glidden and Hayes started, Jacob Hayes is the guy who designed Glidden's now famous house. John Warren Gates is one of my favorite characters in this story of barbed wire and monopolies. Because Gates is a gambler too although he threw way higher stakes poker games than I ever do. And in sweeter digs, because he has a permanent suite at the $30,000 a year Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City. In fact, sometimes he would get these games started on a train in Chicago and then continue the game at the Manhattan Suite once they got to New York. One game he hosted lasted five days and had at least $2 million on the table. And accounts given by the managers of the hotel were that Gates would often cause a ruckus by banging on the elevator doors and yelling down the shaft when he needed someone to come up. Now, John Warren Gates believed that every facet of life was a gamble. A farmer gambles that his crops will grow. A store owner gambles that he will have customers. Even commuters traveling to work or abroad gambled on their safe arrival. And this attitude towards life gave John Warren Gates a nickname which he never really liked. Old Bet-A-Million. Whether or not he liked the nickname, he did bet on virtually anything. On one stormy evening... He was sitting in the Oak Room at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in New York City with two of his stupidly rich friends, and he's looking out the window, and he chooses one of the raindrops stripping down the window and bet $70,000 that the drop that he picked would beat both of the drops of his friends. 
and he wins $600,000. Now, gambling absolutely involves a little bit of luck. But depending on the game, it's also a skill. So as a gambler, Gates honed his skills of reading people, which proved handy in his early days peddling barbed wire for the company in San Antonio, Texas. Gates was promoting barbed wire all throughout the markets of the Southwest with his demonstrations, but the Texans were suspicious of this possible carpetbagger coming in and trying to profit off them by potentially harming their cattle. And what Gates would do is he would stage these demonstrations by building a barbed wire fence and calling on one of the local ranchmen to put their rowdiest cattle inside of the enclosure and then to have them charge towards the wire to test it out. His gamble pays off, and barbed wire is an instant success. Now, Joseph Glidden certainly took notice of John Warren Gates' climbing sails, and he decides to install a more permanent version of a functioning barbed wire fence by constructing the Frying Pan Ranch in Armarillo, Texas. Nicknamed so by the cowboys there because the 1,400 cattle that were brought onto the ranch had the Panhandle brand symbol singed on their hides. And here's a fact that I found funny, I don't know why, but the ranch's eastern border eventually becomes Western Street in Armarillo, Texas. And the whole thing consisted of 150 miles of barbed wire and cost $38,000 to build. Now, besides being a fully functioning ranch, it was basically a 24-hour commercial exhibiting the effectiveness of barbed wire. A cash cow, so to speak. The same good luck and fortune, however, cannot be said of France at the moment, which has just started their ill-fated attempt to construct the Panama Canal linking the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean through a 48-mile trench in Central America. Believe it or not, the idea to build the Panama Canal dates as far back is 1534, with Spain's King Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, whom you may remember from episode one of Scattered Curiosities, titled Let's Go Dutch. He was the father of Felipe el Prudente, King Philip II. But back in 1534, Charles V had ordered expedition surveys of possible water routes through the Americas. Without the Panama Canal, vessels are forced to either unload their ships and move all the cargo across land to a ship that's waiting on the other side, or sail all the way around the southern tip of South America, which was a dangerous, timely, and costly gamble. And in 1788, Thomas Jefferson was suggesting that Spain should build the canal. But the job would eventually fall to the United States in 1904 with the approval of President Theodore Roosevelt. And it will take 10 years to complete and will claim hundreds of lives from the mosquito-borne disease malaria. And the way that the United States got the gig was by supporting these rebel forces that were having a revolt in the country of Panama and then quickly turning around and establishing a relationship with this new nation of rulers and signing a treaty that gave the United States the rights to build the canal for the price of $10 million up front, an annual fee, and the U.S., had to patrol and defend the canal zone along with its own defenses. Panama will not gain full control of the canal until New Year's Eve 1999. Today, it takes six hours to go through the lock system of the canal. Tolls, which are set by the Panama Canal Authority, depends on the class of the vessel, the size, and the cargo. For example, to take a 50-foot boat across the Panama Canal, 
costs about 800 bucks. And the most expensive toll ever paid was by a cruise ship that paid $375,000 to get through in 2010. And one time, $220,000 was paid by some Richie Rich Rich who wanted to bypass a lineup of 90 ships because otherwise he would have had to wait seven days, but only would have had to pay a relatively lower cost of $13,430. And the lowest toll that was ever paid for passage through the canal was 36 cents in 1928 by Richard Halliburton, who swam across it. But back to the 1880s. After all of the income that was generated by John Warren Gates's marketing skills of barbed wire, you would think that he would be made a partner at the company. And so would he. But he's refused such a position by Elwood, Washburn, and Moen. So he decides to break off and he establishes the Southern Wire Company. And to undercut his predecessors, he sells his wire at cheaper prices than that of the company's. And Elwood, Washburn, and Moen fire back at Gates and file for an injunction to put a halt to Southern Wire's barbed wire production, claiming that the machines that Gates uses were direct copies of those used by Washburn and Moen, and they were demanding $100,000 in damages. And then Gates suddenly goes on the defense. And to evade the process servers, he devises this plan to save Southern Wire by renting a building in East St. Louis, Illinois, and moving all of his equipment into it at nighttime, in the dark, on ferry boats. Because as soon as they crossed the Mississippi River, the machines were out of the St. Louis U.S. District Court's jurisdiction, and they were back in business the very next day. Funny enough, after Gates went through all these lengths to avoid prosecution, the judge ended up ruling that the manufacturing process that was used by his Southern Wire Company was not an infringement at all on any of the patents or machinery owned by Elwood, Washburn, and Moen. And shortly thereafter, a fire breaks out and destroys Gates' Southern Wire Company. And old bet million immediately puts on his poker face and makes a bet that a Prussian machinist by the name of William Edenborn, who has just invented a machine that creates a less harmful barbed wire, had not heard about the fire, and Gates approached the Prussian inventor about a merger that would use Edenborn's plant for production. The new company was known as the St. Louis Wire Mill Company, and in addition to producing barbed wire at rock-bottom prices, they slowly began to buy out and merge with smaller wire companies to eventually form the American Steel and Wire Company, seating William Edenborn as president, where he himself will one day be branded a robber baron by an article in a North Louisiana history publication. Just to get you back on track as to where we are year-wise, it's 1885, and on the east coast of the country, J.P. Morgan is enjoying his deluxe Madison Avenue residence at night, to the envy of his neighbors, because it is the first electrically lit private home in New York City, due to J.P. Morgan having backed Thomas Edison's Electric Illumination Company seven years prior. Now that was a good gamble. Out west, though, things are dimmer. There are only 100 buffalo left out of what started as 15 million. Cowboys, settlers, wagon trains, Indians, and barbed wire have all contributed to their decimation. In addition to that, in the decade that barbed wire has been in existence, fences are springing up everywhere at an astounding pace, and conflicts over the fenced and not fenced areas continue to rise. One such incident in Montana resulted in 20 criminals and range squatters to be killed. 
fence cutting becomes a felony in Texas and gives birth to the aptly named Sheep Wars between sheep herders and cattle herders over the grazing rights in Texas, Wyoming, Arizona, and Colorado. And oftentimes, these wars had to be disbanded by the U.S. Army. But none of these things were as devastating as the big die-up of 1885, when three-fourths of free-range Northern Plains cattle got trapped and perished, in part due to barbed wire blocking their natural migration routes. And this causes many people to just ignore the fence-cutting laws in the interest of protecting their cattle. And so then the U.S. government decides to take some kind of action and makes the fencing of public land illegal. But the following winter was a particularly harsh one, and it also slowed the recovery of the cattle industry. And the people had to resort to herding sheep instead, which is physically easier, but all the rich people who live out east don't like mutton. They like beef. Scattered curiosity, one of the ranchers who lost his cattle to the harsh winters of this era? Theodore Roosevelt. And this loss caused him to return to New York City and advance his political career. In 1889, President Benjamin Harrison signs off on the land run, which opened up 2,000 acres of Oklahoma Territory that had previously been taken from Native Americans. On April 22nd, 100,000 farmers and cowboys, called boomers, stood in a line that stretched for miles and miles, and when the starter pistol was fired, they all raced to stake a claim wherever they could. Of course, anyone who was on horseback had a huge advantage over those who were just running around on their feet. And by the day's end, the towns of Guthrie, Norman, and Oklahoma City were all born. And although similar events will open up millions more acres of land, by the early 1890s, finding good farming land on the plains becomes a pretty daunting task. Author Frederick Jackson describes these settlers in his Frontier Thesis, which says, quote, The frontier fundamentally changed the Europeans who immigrated to America. They were now interested in being self-reliant, hopeful, and having a fair shake at being an American success story, end quote. Because in England, good land was expensive, and America had a lot more of it at better prices. So, rich and poor classes were less evident on the frontier because all the rich folk were back east running corporations, while the people on the frontier had all of their money invested in their businesses and the land that they owned. Inside these frontier towns was a warmer sense of community because most of these little towns basically just consisted of poor farmers and artists and they had a pastor and a shopkeeper, a tavern owner, a doctor, just like any of the old towns that you would see in a movie. By 1892, Washburn, Moen, and Elwood's stranglehold on the barbed wire industry sparked 28 separate lawsuits regarding patent legitimacy. And the Supreme Court ruled that Jacob Hayes' S-barb design was indeed an infringement which was technically a win for the company, but turned out to be a timely and costly pursuit on the part of Washburn, Moen, and Elwood. But one would argue that it was well worth the efforts, as all patents were relinquished to the company, awarding them all royalties and damages. But there were still many people, called moonshiners, around the country producing homemade barbed wire without patents, but with the organizational help of the disgruntled former employee of the company, John Warren Gates. And what he does is he organizes these moonshiners to build an alliance against the company, and then he starts quietly buying all the stocks that he can. 
And this turns out to be a pretty good gamble for Bet a Million Gates because many of the rich guys out east are way too busy concerning themselves with the panic of 1893 that saw several of the railroad companies going bankrupt and turning to the government for a bailout. But instead, they have to find their salvation in America's greatest banker, J.P. Morgan who buys out the struggling railroads and consolidates them after having formed General Electric just one year prior with his buddy Thomas Edison. And this practice of taking over struggling businesses was sometimes referred to as Morganization. He even helped the owner of the Chattanooga Times with financing to buy the New York Times. And Thomas Edison is doing pretty good too. And let me just pause for a second to give a shout out to Thomas Edison, a.k.a. Homer Simpson's idol. And that's the second time I've mentioned Homer Simpson in this episode, isn't it? I'm going to have to limit my cultural references to one per episode. But Homer is not completely stupid in admiring Thomas Edison because he and his Edison laboratory staff produced an astounding 2,332 patents globally, with the first hundred or so being related to the telegraph. Amongst the other couple thousands were patents regarding the electric light, telephones, phonographs, electric railways, the reversible galvanic battery, the electric car, the alkaline battery, and the kinetoscope, which realizes its popularity on April 14, 1894, when the Holland Brothers open a kinetoscope parlor on Broadway and 27th Street in New York City. And a kinetoscope, for those of you that don't know, is an early medium for viewing motion pictures. Imagine a wood box about four feet tall or so with a viewfinder that you bend over and peep inside to see a portion of a film. It's like a super sophisticated flip book. And when the Holland brothers opened their parlor in New York City, it had 10 machines at the price of 25 cents per movie. Five machines equal a movie at 5 cents per machine. Which was a lot of money back then. For the very same quarter, you could instead go to Coney Island and get admission to a sea lion show, a dance hall, and three rides. And as kinetoscope parlors started springing up everywhere, Edison and his cronies were obliged to make more movies by building more kinetographs to film them, and eventually his kinetophone to give them sound. And these parlors stood to make $1,400 a month running a business that only cost $515 a month to operate. Now, I ain't not no Albert Einstein, but that seems like a damn fine business model to me. And Edison made bank, too, charging $250 per machine and $10 for the films to load them with. He made $85,000 in the first 11 months. Though Thomas Edison is no Albert Einstein either because he never patents the kinetoscope internationally. Lucky for us, because the kinetoscope served as inspiration to the Lumiere brothers to invent their first commercial movie projection system in France, which took the films out of the private viewing box and put them onto the big screen for the masses to enjoy together. But I won't cry too many tears for Tommy Boy. He did pretty well for himself, with the help of his brilliant team at the Edison Laboratories and generous financiers like J.P. Morgan, the cigar-loving capitalist who hated having his picture taken due to his tall stature, stern eyes, and his big purplish nose, which was caused by a kind of rosacea. And a scattered curiosity about J.P. Morgan, he actually had his own private suite and deck on the Titanic because it was part of his International Mercantile Marine Company, but he fatefully decided at the last minute to extend his stay in France, which he happened to be visiting at the time. 
And a bonus, bonus curiosity, after two of those too, J.P. Morgan supposedly coined the phrase, if you have to ask the price, you can't afford it. Now, if you really want to get up close and personal with J.P. Morgan, I suggest you check out the History Channel's Men Who Built America. They devote an entire episode to the guy. In 1896, William McKinley is elected president with the help of generous donations from J.P. Morgan as well as other Wall Street managers, dealers, traders, executives, and robber barons. And very early into McKinley's first term, the United States is butting heads with Spain over their control of the island of Cuba, 90 miles off of the Florida coast. You see, a revolution was taking place in Havana, and the United States was pressuring Spain to give the Cubans more autonomy. Now, Spain agrees to rebuild the infrastructure of the island if the Cuban rebels will simply just lay down their arms and cease the hostilities. And while the U.S. might find this to be an agreeable compromise, the Cuban rebels refuse Spain's offer outright and continue the fight in the hopes that the Americans would join the battle for their liberation, which we eventually do but not before sending the USS Maine to Cuba to patrol the Havana Harbor. And on February 15th, 1898, at 9.40 p.m., the USS Maine explodes in the Havana Harbor. And of course, the immediate assumption was that Spain had blown it up, which they vehemently denied. And there was an investigation by the U.S. Navy that suggested that the blast was caused by an external explosion that ignited the arsenal magazines on the inside of the main. Of course, there are separate investigations that agree that the arsenal exploded without the spark of an external explosion. But at the time, it really doesn't matter to most Americans because they've been riled up by the headlines of William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. And those infamous headlines read Spanish murderers and remember the Maine. William Randolph Hearst remarked to his illustrator, you furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. And believe it or not, the American population was actually sympathetic towards the poor Cuban revolutionaries being oppressed by these foreign rulers. Americans saw the Cuban revolutionaries as being very much like the American revolutionaries that established the United States. Except instead of fighting England, the Cubans were fighting Spain. McKinley reluctantly asked Congress for $50 million in military funds for a war that he personally did not want. Meanwhile, most of the countries of Europe were advising Spain to avoid war with the United States over Cuba, with the notable exception of Germany, who thinks Spain should put up their dukes. On April 21st, McKinley sends a message to Spain telling them to leave Cuba or else, and Spain cuts off all relations with the United States. And then the United States blockades Cuba effectively starting the 10-week-long Spanish-American War, exactly 52 years to the date after the start of the Mexican-American War. On April 23rd, Spain declares war on the United States, and two days later, the United States responds to Spain by saying that war had already been declared by them two days earlier. So ha! And it is is one of only five times that war has ever been officially declared by the United States Congress. And when the fighting starts in Cuba, President McKinley's 40-year-old cowboy assistant secretary of the Navy decides to saddle up with his Rough Riders to eventually fight in the Battle of San Juan Hill in Cuba. Mr. Theodore Roosevelt, who called the Spanish-American conflict a, quote, Splendid little war. And the weird thing is, 
it kind of was for America anyway. Because remember, the Civil War happened only 30 years ago at this point. So this is one of the first times after the Civil War where Northerners and Southerners were fighting a common enemy together as Americans, thus cooling the animosity between these two former enemies. And there are stories of American soldiers in Cuba who were from the South originally, and they're yelling, you know, go get those damn Yankees. <laughs> when, of course, they mean the Spanish, but it's just a force of habit, I guess. And the Spanish-American War was the first war that saw the use of the movie camera and barbed wire. And Teddy Roosevelt was one of the early victims of barbed wire in warfare when he heroically charges up Kettle Hill with the Rough Riders, but gets his horse tangled in some barbed wire near the top of the hill, and he's forced to walk the rest of the way up minus his faithful steed. And by the end of July, 75% of the military in Cuba is too sick to fight because they all have yellow fever. And all the troops that are stationed there were trying to get Teddy Roosevelt to request a withdraw from Cuba which he gets them. And on August 7th, the U.S. invasion pulls out of Cuba with the exception of the black 9th U.S. Cavalry. Because the cavalry was black, like many of the natives of Cuba, so, theorized the policymakers of the time, they must be immune to yellow fever. This decision is another one of just Thousands of unfortunately racist incidents in American history which seemed perfectly logical and not racist at all to the decision makers of the time. And while there is no scientific evidence to support the U.S. government's reasoning for doing this, surprisingly, only 73 of the 984 men from the Black Ninth U.S. Cavalry actually contract the disease which is still a very high number and completely inexcusable, but not relative to the 75% of the forces that were affected earlier. Let's just call it a coincidence, but pretty weird, right? And on August 13th, 1898, the war has concluded with the signing of yet another Treaty of Paris, which places the United States as protectorate of Cuba and gives it Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines for the price of $20 million, and also results in the end of the Spanish Empire because all of Spain's colonies outside of Africa are instantly transferred to the United States as well. And Theodore Roosevelt returns home to New York to a hero's welcome and is soon elected governor where he gets familiar with labor grievances trusts, lack of conservation, and monopolies. And let's actually get back to monopolies for a second. If you'll remember a few years back, John Warren Gates and his Prussian partner William Edenborn and the Moonshiners had teamed up to challenge the company by buying up all the barbed wire patents and struggling companies that they could. Well, since then, William Edenborn has started the Louisiana Rail and Navigation Company and also retained the Louisiana-Arkansas Short Line, which linked Shreveport to New Orleans. And it was a salvation for that rural area because it severely lacked transportation. And at the cost of about $20 million, it pumped $50 million back into the local economy. Similarly, John Gates has acquired his own choo-choo trains with the purchase of the Kansas City and Gulf Railroad after forcing its bankruptcy and buying out the owner and founder of the Port Arthur Docks, Arthur Edward Stilwell. And while both men are individually successful with their railroads, they remain partners in barbed wire and establish the American Steel and Wire Company, in 1899. But everything was about to change for these two men and the world with the turn of the century. 
Anybody listening to this podcast who can remember the New Year's Eve that brought us from 1999 to 2000 will recall that a lot of anticipation comes along with the birth of a new century. And I know that one was a little extra special because it was also the birth of a new millennium, although technically the new millennium doesn't start till 2001, not 2000. But in any case, when there is the birth of a new century, some people will focus on the fearful things like Y2K and Armageddon, and some people will focus on the hopeful things like the celebration of man's achievements of the previous century and a preview of the achievements yet to come. Enter the 1900 Exposition Universelle in Paris, France, showcasing such new innovations as diesel engines, the escalator, and Russian nesting dolls. And the point of the exposition was to provide an opportunity for foreigners from different lands to recognize the similarities and differences with other nations in an effort to establish understanding between cultures. An example of this was Booker T. Washington helping to organize the exhibit of American Negroes to highlight African-American contributions to America. And if you've ever held a can of Campbell's soup and noticed that little gold medal printed on the outside of the label, well, this is the event where that prize was awarded after Campbell's introduced its 10-cent can of condensed soup. And the exposition ended with the first modern Olympic Games not held in Greece. And it seems like everyone benefited from the exposition of 1900, but France. Because due to low attendance, France loses a ton of money on the exposition. The cost of the event equaled 600 francs more per visitor than the price of admission. Sacre bleu! 1900 introduced setbacks for the rail industry as well after the infamous April 30th train crash outside of Vaughan, Mississippi, piloted by the musically epitomous Casey Jones. And if you think that I'm talking about the guy in a hockey mask that fights alongside the Ninja Turtles in the sewers of New York City, I don't know whether to kiss you or cut you. John Luther Jones grew up near Case, with a C, Kentucky, giving him the nickname Case, which he spelled C-A-S-E-Y. And that is why we know him as K.C. Jones today, thanks to the Grateful Dead, Motorhead, ACDC, and Pete Seeger, who all have songs commemorating the heroic train conductor. But was he heroic or reckless? Case was a well-known engineer of the Illinois Central Railroad for being on time and even had his own signature train whistle that local commuters recognized to be his. And Casey was very well liked by his colleagues, but many of them are on record as referring to him as a risk taker. After this incident where Casey Jones was working on the outside of an engine car, which was moving, by the way, and he sees this girl laying on the tracks ahead. And with no time to slow the train, he climbs down onto the cow catcher and scoops her up and saves her life. And this damsel in distress being tied to a railroad track and rescued scenario will become one of the most recognizable cinematic cliches of early film. But on the contrary, during Casey Jones's career, he was suspended a total of 145 days with nine citations. Now on the night of the fateful crash, The air was painted with rain and fog, which are actually good for conditions for steam trains of the time. The old 382 train, with Case Jones at the helm, departed on its curvy route from Memphis, Tennessee, 75 minutes late due to another train's late arrival. And determined as ever to make up the lost time, Casey Jones speeds through the first portion of the journey through Mississippi, 
and manages to make up 55 minutes of lost time. And then an additional 15 minutes after the second leg of the trip. The final stretch was a mere 25 miles away with a perfectly acceptable five minute delay. And on any normal day, Casey Jones makes it to the depot no problem on time. But tonight, the very next station just happens to be experiencing delays due to a train being moved off the main track onto the sidetrack. And to do this, they need to back the stalled train up and then throw the switch and then proceed to guide it on to the sidetrack. And everything was going fine until there was an air hose failure which locked the last four cars of the train onto the crossover portion of the tracks where the main track and the side track overlap. Now, even though these were the olden times, the railroad people weren't stupid. They had flagmen out on the tracks to warn incoming trains of the situation ahead, but Casey Jones either didn't see them due to the weather, his speed, or, more likely, a combination of the two. But there he was, flying down the train tracks at 75 miles per hour and only two minutes behind when his co-pilot spots the situation ahead and alerts Casey Jones of the inevitable. And Casey orders his co-pilot to jump off the train, which he does, and gets knocked out when he hits the ground. Casey Jones then warns the passengers of the impending impact, and he pulls the brakes and crashes into the caboose of the stalled train, which slowed the train down from 75 miles per hour to 35 miles per hour. Casey Jones is the only person killed in the crash. And his staying on board to pull the brake made him a legend. Now, reports that came in from the flagmen who were along the tracks claim that Jones never heeded their warnings, suggesting that he didn't see them. His widow will wear black every single day for the rest of her life. And interestingly enough, the old 382 train was actually repaired after the crash and even reinstated onto the exact same route for 37 years where she endured several accidents and claimed the lives of six passengers. Ghost train. Scattered curiosity, in the animated Disney classic Dumbo, the circus train is named Casey Jr., but 1900 wasn't all bad news for everybody. Though President McKinley's VP Garrett Hobart has died of heart complications, Theodore Roosevelt has been asked to run alongside McKinley in the upcoming 1900 presidential election, which he reluctantly accepts. Because up until that point in history, vice presidents usually weren't very lucky in succeeding their predecessors, and Teddy wanted to be the president. But don't worry, Teddy would only have to do the job of VP for six months. And the western states of Oregon and California also have reason to celebrate in 1900 because women are allowed to vote for the very first time. And in Texas, a man by the name of Patillo Higgins is digging for oil at Spindletop in Beaumont, Texas, when he runs out of funds and asks a friend to take a gamble on him and help him to finance the digging. John Warren Gates provides the funding needed to continue the dig, giving him 46% ownership of the Texas company. But you may know it better by its present name, Texaco. On January 10th, 1901, Spindletop strikes oil and gushes 10,000 barrels for nine straight days, the biggest strike the world had ever seen at that point, tripling Beaumont, Texas's population in three months and bringing 500 new companies constructed upon 285 oil wells, which included the Chevron Corporation, Gulf Oil, and, you guessed it, Texaco. 
Now, you may recall that Gates had recently gotten control of the Port Arthur, Texas's docks, refinery, and railroad after bankrupting Arthur Stillwell. So shipping his oil was a snap. And this was really good news out west because in the east, J.D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil had a virtual monopoly on petroleum there due to state antitrust laws preventing outsiders from drilling there. Texas had banned products from Standard Oil because of their shady business practices. But the robber barons out east have their eyes feasted on other prey. J.P. Morgan wants to buy the American Steel and Wire Company from John Warren Gates and William Edenborn and makes them a strictly financial offer that called for the removal of Gates from the company as a provision of the sale. John Warren Gates was not welcome to take part in any facet of the newly formed business as part of management or on the company's board of directors. And before Gates even had the time to be insulted by the offer, J.P. added that if Gates refused the offer, that he would build his own wire production plant and threatens to crush John's wire company, railroads, and oil business in Port Arthur, Texas. And William Edenborn and the shareholders of American Steel and Wire want to sell and they have the votes to make the transaction a done deal. So Gates is out. And once J.P. Morgan acquires American Steel, he wastes no time in arranging a merger with Carnegie Steel and other struggling iron businesses to form the U.S. Steel Corporation, which was sold for $480 million with a Jersey contract. Now, for those of you that don't know, a Jersey contract is done with a handshake only. No lawyers, no signing, very gangster and cool. U.S. Steel will go on to become the world's first billion-dollar company, owning two-thirds of all steel production in America. And many people accuse it of holding a monopoly over the bridge building and steel and nail shipbuilding and car and train manufacturing industries. But ever a man of action, John Gates fires back at J.P. Morgan by purchasing shares in the Northern Pacific Railroad to gain control of the Midwestern rail lines, which included the Chicago rail lines, which J.P. Morgan needed to use. And when J.P. finds out about this, he pulls some strings and stops the sale of the stocks, which were now priced so sky high that all the other railroad stocks dropped so dramatically that all the short sellers couldn't get enough shares to cover the difference and ended up losing a ton of money. Gates is said to have walked away with 60,000 shares into Northern Pacific, but that number has not been confirmed. On May 8th, 1901, America saw the first market crash of the New York Stock Exchange due to the exchanges of railroad ownership between J.P. Morgan, James J. Hill, E.H. Harriman, and Jacob Schiff. Now, Harriman was trying to monopolize the Chicago rails for the Union Pacific, and he started to butt heads with James J. Hill of the Northern Pacific, who was backed by J.P. Morgan. So, Harriman started buying up Northern Pacific stock in order to control it, and by 1 p.m., stock prices began to fall for the Burlington, St. Paul, Missouri, Pacific, Sugar, U.S. Steel, Amalgamated Copper, Union Pacific, and then the whole market. And the whole panic was supposedly fueled by a rumor that J.P. Morgan's broker had died, which he hadn't. And in the end, Northern Pacific actually makes a net advance of 16.5 points. And Harriman and Hill team up to form the Northern Securities Company and took control of the Northern Pacific, Burlington, and Great Northern. But the monopoly was quickly disbanded 
due to the Sherman Antitrust Act from 1890 that we discussed earlier. We learned something. Then, on September 6, 1901, President McKinley is shot by an anarchist at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo, New York, and dies eight days later, making Theodore Roosevelt the youngest person to hold the office. Now, I know a ton of you are going to call me on this, so let me just clarify right now. He's the youngest to take office when he takes over office for McKinley, not when he is elected later in 1904. The youngest elected president is Kennedy. And like Kennedy, Teddy Roosevelt is progressive and liberal for the times and becomes the very first president to invite an African-American man to dinner at the White House, Booker T. Washington. And the still very segregated South at the time was outraged. And Teddy couldn't believe the reactions, and he planned to have Washington over for dinner again. Though he never actually does. Roosevelt gives a 20,000-word speech to Congress to limit the powers of big corporations or trusts and gets involved with the 1902 anthracite coal miners who have gone on strike and have severely jeopardized national energy. Roosevelt threatens to send federal troops if the workers and employers don't hash out a deal. So... J.P. Morgan steps in to help the newly elected president avoid a crisis by getting the workers more pay for fewer hours, but still no union. And the maverick president then forges ahead and gets the railroad rates regulated and creates the Pure Food and Drug Act, the Inspection Act, the Antiquities Act, the Meat Inspection Act, And don't forget, of course, the 18 national monuments, 150 national forests, 51 bird reserves, five national parks, and over 1,000 executive orders. House Speaker Joseph Cannon said, quote, That fellow at the end of the avenue wants everything from the birth of Christ to the death of the devil. But Theodore Roosevelt just wanted a square deal for every American, meaning everybody should have the opportunity to be successful, not just the big corrupt companies and robber barons. He also created the press briefing room one day when he saw reporters standing outside of the White House in the rain and he urged them to come inside even though he will actually be the one to coin the term muckraker, referring to journalists who made certain charges. In a scattered curiosity, he hated being called Teddy. His friends called him Colonel or Theodore or simply by his initials, T.R., Teddy was a nickname given to him as a result of a bear hunting trip that he took in Mississippi when he condemned the unsportsmanlike companions who were with him who were trying to get him to shoot a tied up bear that they had captured. And a political cartoon of the incident was printed in the Washington Post And the drawing of Roosevelt in the cartoon inspired Morris Mitchum to create the iconic teddy bear. It's still 1902, and John Gates senses weakness in a few of J.P. Morgan's railways and buys shares in his Louisville and Nashville Railroad. And, with luck on his side, a clerical error releases prices for 50,000 shares in Morgan's short line for sale before the New York Stock Exchange got a hold of it. And Gates swoops in and scoops up 51% of the shares in the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. J.P. Morgan is freaking out and once again is trying to get the sale annulled, but he can't. And so he goes to Gates and he asks him what he wants for the stock. $150 per share was the offer given to J.P. Morgan which is rejected 
initially. Then, at 1.30 in the morning, J.P. Morgan sends an assistant over to John Warren Gates's Waldorf Astoria suite and signs a deal for $43 million, earning John a $15 million profit on his purchase. Another underdog that wins in 1902 is Cuba, who gains its independence from Spain on May 20th. Though the U.S. will hold restrictions over the island, forbidding them from having alliances with other countries and allowing the U.S. to intervene in such affairs and also to retain a lifelong lease on Guantanamo Bay, so, hmm, maybe that's not a win at all. Sorry, Cuba. I really do hope to go to you one day. John Warren Gates, on the other hand, was victorious in the deal. Financially. But J.P. Morgan was determined to hurt Gates socially and throughout the business world. And suddenly, Gates was not looked at favorably in public anymore. Even the Claridge Hotel in England refuses his reservation because he was now on their list of undesirables. John Gates will end up having the last laugh, though, because he will spend the rest of his life taking this from J.P. Morgan, too, by becoming a beloved philanthropist. In 1904, a conglomerate of 123 factories in Illinois known as the American Can Company, is transformed into the Continental Can Company by Edwin Norton and introduces the first open-top can that was crimped rather than soldered on. And Theodore Roosevelt is elected president for his second-ish term, more on that later, with the purse of $2 million in campaign donations from U.S. Steel, J.P. Morgan and Company, and George J. Gould of the Railroads. Now, to put that in perspective, the Democrats of 1904 only managed to raise $7,000 in campaign donations. Roosevelt will then go on to beef up the U.S. Navy and will have them tour the world to demonstrate our forces' capabilities. And he will also win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1906 for his role in negotiating an end to the Russo-Japanese War. A friend of T.R. calls him, quote, the best herder of emperors since Napoleon. With government seemingly in J.P. Morgan's pocket, John Warren Gates makes sure to also get on the favorable side of the law and donates the Port Arthur Canal and Dock Company to the U.S. government with the provision that it be made an international port of entry. Then, on October 9th, 1906, the former educator, inventor, philanthropist extraordinaire, and Gates' former employer, Joseph Glidden, dies in DeKalb, Illinois, at the age of 93. But the country scarcely has time to grieve because Oklahoma is becoming a state. And the panic of 1907 was right around the corner. The banks of New York are on the verge of bankruptcy and are looking for a government bailout at the price of $35 million. Who are you going to call? J.P. Morgan! And that's precisely what Theodore Roosevelt does. Morgan gets all of the bank heads together and they devise a plan to move money between banks to help widen international credit. All the while, buying stocks from failing corporations like Tennessee Coal and Iron, or... TCI. Roosevelt grants the bankers immunity in the deal that J.P. Morgan puts $30 million into, and he is hailed as the man who saved the banks. But Roosevelt will be a thorn in J.P. Morgan's side for the rest of his life as Teddy goes after many of the unscrupulous robber barons of the time. 
pretty ironic considering that TR's 1904 election campaign was greatly financed by Standard Oil, U.S. Steel, and J.P. Morgan in an attempt to get Roosevelt into their pockets. J.P. Morgan would soon say of Roosevelt, We bought him, but he wouldn't stay bought. And not to be outdone by J.P. in the eyes of T.R., John Gates is do-gooding all over his new hometown of Port Arthur, Texas, and he is revered by his fellow citizens. He founds the first Port Arthur Bank, builds a rice mill, and starts the Port Arthur Light, Power, and Ice Company. And after his wife dies, he builds the Mary Gates Hospital in her memory. He also begins construction of the Plaza Hotel to replace the Port Arthur's Hotel Sabine that burned down the year that Roosevelt was elected. Gates wanted the town to be in control of the hotel, and he helped them to finance it by matching the $150,000 that the citizens were able to raise in donations. And on November 15, 1909, the Plaza Hotel opens with Gates's Billion Dollar Banquet, where he invited railroad owners, Texas company board members, and other wealthy businessmen to establish a clientele for the hotel. Gates even worked as the hotel manager for the first few weeks, and he was adamant about hiring black workers, which was a big deal at the time because African Americans were not allowed to live and work in the city. Another milestone that happens in 1909, tuna is put into tin cans for the very first time. John Gates is then nominated for U.S. Senator by the East District of Texas, which he graciously refuses so he can focus instead on his stable of show horses in the hopes of having a circus in Port Arthur. Then, in 1911, a malignant growth is found in John Warren Gates's throat that inhibits his speaking. But in May, when the United States Congress calls on him to give testimony in an investigation of J.P. Morgan and U.S. Steel, he is determined to find his voice, and he makes a statement to the feds that further their investigation. And J.P. Morgan is just stewing in it. Then on August 9th, John Warren Gates dies after suffering complications from an operation on the throat tumor. His funeral was held on three dedicated floors of the Plaza Hotel in New York City, which he'd helped fund years earlier. In Port Arthur, Texas, the flags were put at half-mast and businesses were shut down from 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. His estate was worth 40 to $50 million when he was laid to rest in Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx, New York. And a scattered curiosity... If you've seen the third installment of the Back to the Future movies, the one that's set in 1885, there's a scene that takes place about the last third of the movie where Doc Brown, who's played by Christopher Lloyd, is despondent inside of the saloon because he cannot tell his girlfriend Clara, played by Mary Steenburgen, why he had to break up with her to help Marty McFly get back to the year 1985 and... He is approached by an old wise man holding barbed wire and the old guy gives him some advice. Now, it's unclear whether it's supposed to be John Warren Gates or Joseph Glidden, but I leave you to be the judge. I recently went back and watched it and the things that the guy says sound a lot like what I imagine John Warren Gates would say, but... He looks a lot more like what Joseph Glidden looks like in my eyes. Now, as much as I want to say that J.P. Morgan danced on John Gates's grave, I can't because it only ever happened in my mind. But it doesn't really matter because Mr. Morgan, the man who once said, I owe the public nothing, will be dead two years later leaving behind business ties with GE, AT&T, U.S. Steel, United Dry Goods, 
the American Bridge Company, in addition to 24 railroads. And in an almost honorific fashion, the Federal Reserve System is created the same year he dies in an effort to prevent another panic of 1907 that J.P. himself was so integral in saving. J.D. Rockefeller scoffed at the mere $80 million estate that J.P. Morgan willed to his son, J.P. Jr., and he said, quote, and to think he wasn't even a rich man. Ouch. J.D. was equally unliked by the public as well. In fact, three years after Morgan's death on the 4th of July, two members of the anarchist Black Cross plotted with the industrial workers of the world to bomb J.D. Rockefeller's home in Terrytown, New York with dynamite that was provided by Russia. But they were thwarted when the dynamite ignited prematurely as they were building the device, causing the Lexington Avenue explosion at 1626 Lexington Avenue in New York City, which killed four and injured dozens. And another plot was circumvented the following year in Terrytown, outside the home of another robber baron, J.D. Archibald. Come on, you lazy mothers. J.D., J.P., J.C., give your kids some damn names. And the dynamite outside Archibald's estate was discovered along the home's driveway by the gardener. And across the ocean, that same July... Bombs will soon devastate Europe with the beginning of World War I. But before we get there, let's talk about the election of 1912 for a second. And yet, even before we can talk about that, we need to backtrack even more to get up to speed with the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. The presidency and the entire life and career of Theodore Roosevelt is truly fascinating, heroic, surprising, and offensive at times, while simultaneously being inspiring. He started out as a scrappy New York kid who suffered nighttime asthma attacks, and he was conflicted his whole life regarding his feelings for his father, Theodore Roosevelt Sr., otherwise known as The whose bravery, honesty, strength, and financial aid to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Teddy admired. But he also felt shame that Thee opted out of fighting in the Civil War by hiring a replacement in the draft of the Army of the Potomac, which was a perfectly legal and common thing to do, by the way. You'll remember that J.P. Morgan did the same thing. I mean... Rich people have been doing this forever. You have to look at it from Thee's perspective, though. Teddy's mother, Theodore Sr.'s wife, Martha Bullock, or Mitty, was a true Southern belle and, quite possibly, a real-life inspiration for Scarlett O'Hara. Now, Mitty is from the South, and her brothers, who are Teddy's uncles, were fighting for the Confederacy. Teddy Roosevelt believed that a man should fight, which is one of the reasons that he's so determined to go off and fight at the age of 40 when the Spanish-American War breaks out. He wants to go, and he will insist that his sons fight in their respective wars when their time comes. Roosevelt became a world-class author of an astonishing 35 books and was a man of the world by the time he was 11 years old, having toured Europe and Egypt and hiking in the Alps, which actually helped his asthma and gave him a lifelong desire for activity. He wrote in his journal his desire to get action, and he would live by this credo. At the age of 24, he was a New York State Assemblyman and challenged corrupt corporations and judges for three years before losing a passion for politics on the state level after Grover Cleveland was nominated for governor of New York instead of him. And he foolishly said he'd give, quote, hearty support to any decent Democrat. <laughs> 
He later tried to backtrack that statement by commenting that it wasn't meant for publication. But the damage was done. So, he retires from politics and goes off to his newly built ranch in North Dakota called Elkhorn and became a cowboy by learning to hunt, rope and ride western style, and eventually becoming the deputy sheriff, where one time he captured three outlaws who had stolen his boat, and then he brought them to justice, and then saved the men from a vigilante hanging. He loved it out there, and so did his territory folks. Remember the Oklahoma song from part one of this episode? He helped his fellow ranchers understand and organize conservation tactics and educated them on how to avoid overgrazing. And he forms the Boone and Crockett Club. But then the big die-up and the harsh winter of 1886 happened, also covered in part one, and Roosevelt and his neighbors lose their cattle. TR is out $80,000 and he moves back east and is quickly asked to run for mayor of New York City. He accepts the nomination, but loses the election, and gets to writing his successful book, The Winning of the West. Then, when he was approached by President Benjamin Harrison, he was taken on as the U.S. Civil Service Commissioner. The New York Sun said Roosevelt was, quote, irrepressible, belligerent, and enthusiastic. End quote. And Roosevelt took on the postal workers who wouldn't hire or deliver mail to African Americans. And he was so good at his job that when the next president, Grover Cleveland, came through, he kept him on after Harrison left office, which doesn't happen very often. And with a talent for cleaning up the corrupt, Roosevelt was then approached to be the president of the New York City Police Commissioners perhaps the most corrupt police department in the country. Theodore required frequent inspections, physical exams, and hired 1,600 cops based on mental and physical capabilities rather than their religious or political affiliation. And he put phones in the police station. And Teddy himself would go undercover late at night and check up on his officers. And in 1896, he starts doing stump speeches for William McKinley's campaign, helping him defeat William Jennings Bryant, and was brought on to McKinley's cabinet as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, a position that FDR will also hold for one year before he resigns to go fight in the Spanish-American War with his Rough Riders. Colonel Theodore Roosevelt is elected governor of New York upon his return, which turns out to be another one-year job that proves invaluable because he becomes aware of the troubles caused by monopolies, labor disputes, trusts, and lack of conservation, and he keeps in touch with his public by having two press conferences a day. Because of the circumstances surrounding his first term, McKinley's assassination, it was unclear if it even counted as a term at all. Remember, back then, there was no law limiting presidential terms, but George Washington had declined a third term forever ago and set a precedent and tradition that lasted all the way up until T.R.'s fifth cousin and nephew by marriage, Franklin, would become the 32nd president for a record 12 years. Teddy Roosevelt was promoted from vice president just one year into McKinley's second term and was elected in his own right in 1904 for a total of seven years. As 1908 approached, Roosevelt was at the height of his popularity. And stupidly, but in his mind honorably, declared that he would not run for a third term, calling his first term by assassination a technicality. His family was shocked. His party was shocked. And most shocked of all was Teddy himself. He regretted it for the rest of his life and did everything he could to groom his successor, William Howard Taft, 
to keep his progressive trajectory alive. But Roosevelt will go on to criticize Taft and the entire Republican Party in the coming years. And with Roosevelt now out of office, he needed to get action. So he leaves New York to go on a year-long safari with the Smithsonian Roosevelt African Expedition, financed by the Smithsonian Institution, Andrew Carnegie, and the writings of Theodore Roosevelt himself. J.P. Morgan quipped of the safari, I hope every lion does his duty. T.R. hunted for exhibits to be installed in the Smithsonian and the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, and the expedition trapped and killed over 11,000 insects, hippos, rhino, and elephants. And the conservation king himself said of his safari, quote, I can be condemned only if the existence of the National Museum, the American Museum of Natural History, and all similar zoological institutions are to be condemned, end quote. And once the safari was over, he got more action and went on tour of Europe through Egypt and remarked what a lovely job the English were doing ruling there, adding that he didn't believe that Egypt was ready for independence or fully capable of governing themselves. He felt the same way about the Philippines back in the Spanish-American War. The viciously progressive, yet ever so slightly bigoted Mr. Roosevelt was an enigma. I mean, for the times, his views were considered to be pretty tolerant. But, like any heroic figure, he was not without his character flaws. Dan Carlin, the world's greatest podcaster and storyteller, perfectly refers to Teddy Roosevelt as a sort of racist Peter Pan. By the way, please support Dan Carlin's Hardcore History and Common Sense podcasts. I'm not even worthy to speak his name. He is the greatest. Anyway, after Roosevelt's time in Egypt, he then went on to tour Europe and met with Franz Joseph, the Emperor of Austria-Hungary, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, King George V of Great Britain, and he spoke in Oslo, Norway, asking for limits on naval powers and creating a league of peace amongst what he often referred to as civilized nations. When Roosevelt returned to the United States, he was pretty displeased with President Taft's way of dealing with conservation and tariffs and giving more power to Congress. And Roosevelt stressed to the state convention for Republicans that we need a new nationalism in America that focuses on workers over profit gains and banning political donations by corporations. And the Democrats end up taking control of the House for the first time in 20 years, amongst whom was a New York State Senator by the name of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who actually supported his Republican cousin Uncle President's policies. The Republican Party must reorganize. Roosevelt gets to writing for a publication called The Outlook, where he argues for a progressive movement that would oppose special privilege and be, quote, in favor of an honest and efficient political and industrial democracy, end quote. And he continues to criticize President Taft. And Taft fires back when the Justice Department issues an antitrust suit against U.S. Steel in 1911 which was heart-crushing to Roosevelt because he was the president who approved the purchase that was in question. But, ever the bigger man, which is saying something when being compared to the hefty President Taft, Roosevelt is all for party unity and says that he will not run against Taft in 1912 as a Republican but instead planned to run in 1916 against whichever Democrat ends up beating Taft in these elections. This became an issue, though, because he'd previously said he wouldn't seek a third term. Roosevelt says, quote, 
I will accept the progressive nomination on a progressive platform, and I shall fight to the end, win or lose. So, he kind of keeps his word by not running against them as a Republican and founds his own third party, just as the Republicans had done when Abraham Lincoln was elected and called it the Progressive Party or the Bull Moose Party that would challenge the bosses and the corrupt politicians and judges. Why Bull Moose? Because Roosevelt commented to reporters that, quote, I am as fit as a bull moose, end quote. He then goes on to tell the 1912 Progressive National Convention, quote, We stand at Armageddon and we battle for the Lord, end quote. And he calls for more of what he has always stood for by saying, quote, To destroy this invisible government, to dissolve the unholy alliance between corrupt businesses and corrupt politics is the first task of the statesmanship of the day. This country belongs to the people. Its resources, its business, its laws, its institutions should be utilized, maintained, or altered in whatever manner will best promote the general interest. This assertion is explicit. End quote. He goes on to say of the Democratic nominee Woodrow Wilson, quote, Mr. Wilson must know that every monopoly in the United States opposes the Progressive Party. I challenge him to name the monopoly that did support the Progressive Party, whether the Sugar Trust, the U.S. Steel Trust, the Harvester Trust, the Standard Oil Trust, the Tobacco Trust, or any other. Ours was the only program to which they objected, and they supported either Mr. Wilson or Mr. Taft. End quote. How do you not vote for this guy? While he was on the campaign trail in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Theodore Roosevelt was shot by a saloon owner by the name of John Flaming Shrank. All assassins have to have three-word names, right? Except John Shrank only earns the title of attempted assassin because the bullet was slowed by Roosevelt's glasses case and his huge 50-page folded speech that was tucked in his breast pocket. Now, don't misunderstand me here. The bullet did hit Roosevelt in the chest, and he bled. But he refused to go straight to the hospital until he could deliver a 90-minute speech that opened with, quote, Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know whether you fully understand that I've just been shot, but... It takes more than that to kill a bull moose, end quote. Again, how do you not vote for this guy? After the speech is over, he's taken to the hospital and off of the campaign trail for the ending weeks of the election. Doctors determine that the bullet is in a spot that isn't threatening, but could be if it were to be removed, so it stays with Teddy for the next seven years slowing down his lifelong daily exercises permanently, and he began to gain weight. By running as a third-party candidate, Roosevelt splits the Republican vote in half, effectively handing the 1912 victory over to the former president of Princeton University and rookie Democratic politician Woodrow Wilson. You'd think that Teddy Roosevelt now 55 years old, with a bullet in his chest, would slow down after all this. But you'd be wrong, because he instead goes on another safari on behalf of the American Museum of Natural History, this time to South America with his son Kermit, and he writes about the expedition in his Through the Brazilian Wilderness. And unlike his previous adventures, this one almost kills Theodore when he injures his leg after jumping in a river to save two canoes from crashing into the rocks. And he develops a tropical fever that's similar to malaria. Kermit manages to get his father out of there. 50 pounds lighter, but alive. It really is tough to kill a bull moose, huh? And upon his return to New York... The Progressive Party, 
approaches him about running for governor in 1914, but he declines due to his health and because he instead wants to make a comeback with the Republicans and run for president again. On June 28, 1914, the Archduke of Austria-Hungary, Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist, triggering a four-year conflict that brought warfare from infantry and cavalry to tanks and planes, from canvas hats to helmets, and the use of muskets and arrows to poison gas and flamethrowers, and decorating the European landscape with trenches and barbed wire. This is the beginning of the Great War, or World War I, where a hand grenade shape, size, and weight are specifically designed to resemble a standard American baseball because any American soldier should be able to throw it with accuracy. Wire cutters become standard issue to soldiers on all fronts to overcome the infinite miles of barbed wire stretching out over no man's land. Though they often prove ineffectual, as German wire was thicker than British wire. So sometimes, when soldiers were under enemy fire, infantrymen would just lie on top of the barbed wire to kind of make a bridge for his comrades to walk over him because blasting did very little to remove the barbed wire, though by 1916, tanks will be able to drive right over it. And by the war's end, Germany experienced a wire shortage and started using barbed tape, which is punched out of a rolled ribbon of steel tape. Barbed tape has a harder steel core than barbed wire, and it's very difficult to cut. Scattered Curiosity while German trenches were usually deeper than British ones, at an average of 12 feet deep rather than 8 feet deep, the British ones had better names, such as the Beer Trench, Pilsen Trench, Bitter Trench, and Ale Alley. Theodore Roosevelt was a strong supporter of the Allied forces in Europe and denied President Wilson's foreign policy and thought that we should be fighting in this war with them. Remember, America didn't join the struggle for almost three years. In 1916, Roosevelt is out there stumping for the Republicans, and he spoke out against people who identify as Irish-American or German-American, saying that they were unpatriotic to self-identify as a hyphenated American instead of a 100% American. And... Ever the cowboy, he even offers to get his rough riders back together and go over to Europe and fight alongside the Allies, which is denied by the Wilson administration. Then, in 1917, the British intercept a message from Germany to Mexico that states that if America were to join the war, Mexico would be awarded Texas and Arizona if they fought for Germany and prevailed. Roosevelt was incensed that Wilson didn't declare war right then and there. Instead, it would take the ever-increasing sinking of U.S. merchant ships by German submarines to force Wilson's hand to join the conflict. Congress passes the Espionage Act of 1917 to punish anyone who interferes with foreign relations and U.S. commerce. And then the next year, they put an extension on it with the Sedition Act of 1918. And that included a ban on speaking out against the government or the war through expressed opinions that feature the government or the war effort in a negative way. You could get 5 to 20 years in prison if found guilty, and the Postmaster General could refuse to deliver your mail. The Sedition Act of 1918 passed through the Senate 48 to 26, and 293 to 1 in the House of Representatives. The only person in Congress to oppose it? Meyer London of New York. Well, another New Yorker does oppose it, Theodore Roosevelt, because he spoke out against it vigorously. And one of the first people who was arrested under this new law? Our old friend and John Warren Gates' former partner, the naturally born Prussian businessman William Edenborn, who is now 70 years old. In 
and here's what he said to get him arrested. Quote, There has been much talk about Germany coming over here and attacking the United States. We need have no fear that Germany will ever attack the United States. It would take a maritime nation to do that because America is surrounded by water. America can look to other countries for attacks in the future. Recently, a certain prime minister, referring to David Lloyd George, stated, Our nation is mistress of the sea. Our nation has been mistress of the sea and will always be mistress of the sea. End quote. That's it. That's all he said. And the U.S. government turns around and refers to Edenborn as the father of the wire industry, who, quote, breathed the arrogant spirit of Prussianism in its most hateful form, which constituted seditious treason, being in effect pro-German propaganda of the most cunning, insidious, and demoralizing sort to the morale of the American people, having the direct effect of sowing seeds of discord, discontent, and hatred against the great government, Great Britain, with whom we are associated in bonds of brotherly love. End quote. Yikes. Roosevelt will cautiously continue to support the war effort and a push for the League of Nations and Germany's total surrender to Allied forces until the war's end on November 11, 1918 but will criticize Woodrow Wilson's proposed 14-point speech that provides a blueprint to the Treaty of Versailles that eventually ends the war. The 14 points called for a reduction of world armaments, freedom of the seas, ending of secret treaties, and an end to colonization. And a lot of those 14 points were actually included in the eventual treaty although the UK refuses to sign off on the freedom of seas thing, and they also want Germany to make reparations for the war. Roosevelt said, quote, If the League of Nations is built on a document as high-sounding and as meaningless as the speech in which Mr. Wilson laid down his 14 points, it will simply add one more scrap to the diplomatic waste paper basket. Most of these 14 points would be interpreted to mean anything or nothing. End quote. Germany would be made to pay reparations, limit their army to 100,000 men, and they could no longer have an air force. Woodrow Wilson wins his own Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts. And some people thought that Teddy Roosevelt might make a comeback with the Republicans and run again in 1920. But... In early 1919, Teddy Roosevelt dies in his sleep at his home in Sagamore Hill. And when Roosevelt's son, Archibald, broke the news to his brothers and sisters, he said, quote, the old lion is dead, end quote. And Wilson's vice president, Thomas Marshall, remarked, quote, death had to take Roosevelt sleeping, for if he had been awake, there would have been a fight, end quote. Roosevelt was laid to rest in Oyster Bay, New York. And the next year, the Sedition Act of 1818 is repealed. And in 1939, Teddy's face is carved on Mount Rushmore in South Dakota, alongside George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and George Jefferson. Well, hey, we're moving on up. <laughs> Just kidding. Of course, it's Thomas Jefferson. Although, wouldn't you love it if it was George Jefferson, along with J.J. Walker, Marla Gibbs, and Jack A.? If you like Teddy Roosevelt, there's a great Simpsons episode from season 23 called Bart Stops to Smell the Roosevelts, where Superintendent Chalmers gets all the mischievous bullies and troublemakers interested in history by romanticizing the cowboy Colonel Hunter President, who was often referred to as an imperialist and the greatest herder of emperors since Napoleon. By the way, for those of you wondering, William Edenborn is not wallowing in prison. He lives until 1926 where he is considered to be one of the wealthiest men in America, and he too, like his deceased business partner John Warren Gates, had a huge turnout for his funeral. Twelve trucks full of flowers were sent, and the line of mourners stretched 15 blocks. One of Edenborn's longtime railroad colleagues, Henry Hartner, said of him, quote, <laughs> 
he brought millions of dollars to Louisiana, which he used for the development of latent natural resources. He was honest, temperate, charitable, and above all, just a man. He asked only reasonable service of his employees, and he was never fault-finding. Poor and democratic in life, rich and powerful in death, he approached the grave as one who wraps the drapery of his couch about him and lies down to pleasant dreams. End quote. A week after his death, William's wife, Sarah Edenborn, takes over her husband's position as head of the Louisiana Railway and Navigation Company, and she is the first woman in Louisiana to hold such a position. So what's my point here? After talking for three hours, I don't even know that my job is to make some kind of definitive statement. I just share my research with you and invite you to assess it. Although I would argue that there are considerable comparisons and connections to be made between tin cans, barbed wire, Napoleon Bonaparte I, the emperor, and Theodore Roosevelt, the cowboy emperor. Neither man perfect, both hard-headed scrappers that never ran from a confrontation and believed enough in his convictions and championed for the fairness amongst the common man while glad-handing with the robber barons of their times. Both men had impacts on their respective countries that are clearly evident today. Is Napoleon a hero in the traditional sense? No, but he did bring reform and an end to the Spanish Inquisition in Europe. Is Roosevelt a hero in the traditional sense? No, but his efforts towards progressiveness and conservationism are unparalleled. He once said, quote, Conservation means development as much as it does protection. I recognize the right and duty of this generation to develop and use the natural resources of our land, but I do not recognize the right to waste them or to rob, by wasteful use, the generations that come after us. End quote. As you can see, history does indeed progress while at the same time repeating familiar themes generation after generation. Even Adolf Hitler studied the history of Napoleon's conquest, and he still fell for the same trap set by the eastward retreating Russians in World War II, which most likely lost him the war. I have absolutely nothing redeeming or kind or complimentary to say about Adolf Hitler, other than maybe he was good at talking loud and being Charlie Chaplin for Halloween except not in a funny way, like in a truly, eerily, terrifyingly haunting Charlie Chaplin way. And though T.R.'s fifth cousin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, is a Democrat, his presidency will be all about a progressive government that pulls America out of the Great Depression with his New Deal programs that put America back to work and focus on relief, recovery, and reform. His Works Program Act, otherwise known as the WPA, built hospitals, roads, schools, 650,000 miles of highways, 125,000 public buildings, bridges, reservoirs, parks, playgrounds, and promoted unions, and introduced the Social Security Act, and set a 40-hour work week, minimum wages, unemployment compensation, and outlawed child labor. The WPA also subsidized artists, musicians, and writers by putting murals and sculptures in government buildings, commissioning plays, and sponsoring concerts. Some of the works projects that were built, the Lincoln Tunnel, the Triboro Bridge, LaGuardia Airport, the Overseas Highway, and the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge. By 1935, beer brewed by the Kruger Beer Company is canned for the first time ever with the American Can Company and debuted just in time for FDR to introduce the Wealth Tax Act that put a 79% tax on incomes that were over $5 million a law that applied to only one person in America, J.D. Rockefeller. I bet he regrets that rich guy comment he made about J.P. Morgan now, huh? 
FDR also got the Soil Conservation and Domestic Allotment Act passed, which planted 200 million trees in addition to Osage Orange, which we covered in episode one, stretching from Canada to Texas to help keep water in the ground and soil held down to form 30,233 shelter belts to tame erosion. He also helped ranchers by buying cows at inflated prices and taught farmers how to combat erosion and introduced crop rotation and contour plowing to help combat the dust bowl storms of the dirty 30s that plagued the Great Plains due to poor farming techniques, deep plowing, burning weeds, removal of native grasses, which actually holds the soil in place during dry seasons and kills nutrients, and caused massive dust storms, which were called black rollers and black blizzards that stretched across the entire country. One storm of the 1930s migrated from the Great Plains to Chicago to New York City, dropping 12 million pounds of dust and causing New England to experience red snow the following winter. The Dust Bowl displaced 500,000 people, and over 85,000 of them from Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas relocate to California, where they are called Okies, Arkies, and Texies. When World War II started up, the United States feared a change in leadership, and they kept FDR on for a record 12-year presidency. And even this seemingly great man and leader and president also signed into law Executive Order 9066, which deported Japanese, German, and Italian Americans into internment camps in 1942. Even after a secret study that he commissioned found that Japanese people living in American were not a security threat. Many of the 120,000 Japanese, which was two-thirds of the Japanese-American population at the time, and 10,000 Germans and 3,000 Italians that were interned in these camps had been in America for 20 to 40 years, and their children were natural-born citizens. Not one single person in these camps was ever found guilty of espionage. FDR suspended the order in 1944, and they were all shut down completely by 1946. But Japanese nationals still couldn't be U.S. citizens until 1952. So even the great liberator Franklin Delano Roosevelt is a dick too. So you can't find any perfect leader. And one last scattered curiosity. In 1988, President Ronald Reagan signs the Civil Liberties Act that paid reparations and issued official letters of apology to surviving internees of the 1942 camps. Let's hope we never repeat that trend in history ever again. Boy, oh boy, gang, this one nearly killed me, coming in a little bit over three hours. Sorry about that. I promise you the next episode is not going to be nearly as long, and we're going to explore the moons of our solar system. Doesn't that sound like fun? As always, we would greatly appreciate any feedback that you have to give us and all those stars you can give us on iTunes. And if you do like us, please recommend us to your friends. We would love to have them get in in our little nerdy club here. to help us keep the curiosities coming please rate us on itunes soundcloud or your favorite podcast platform and don't forget to visit scatteredcuriosities.com for exclusive free downloads and to donate to the show